redundant, 11 o'clock Sunday service. A very warm welcome to you. If this is your first time coming, or if this is your uh, 124th time coming, you're all welcome. Please feel free to, uh, to fill up the rows. There's a lovely empty row at the front here. Um, nothing wrong with these chairs. Find us, you know, high quality chairs. Anyway, we're going to start off with uh, a quick word of prayer, then I'm going to hand over to the, uh, the guys who are primed and ready to uh, play the keys and pluck the strings and hit the skins, is it skins? Skins, skins. yeah. And, and stick into those things, yeah. Like <laughs> Lord, we just thank you for today. We thank you to see uh, so many people gathered here this morning uh, on this beautiful morning. We thank you for your uh, creation, which is uh, all around us this morning. And uh, we just want that sense of family here this morning. We are, we are ga- gathered together, uh, all as part of, of your family. And uh, just pray that we just enjoy each other's company, Lord. We'll just be able to catch up with each other, Lord, and just encourage each other, Lord, and just... Uh, just chat to each other, Lord, and just to, just to do church with each other, Lord, just to be there for each other, Lord. And if some of us are struggling, Lord, I just pray that we'll just feel comfortable just to share with others our struggles, Lord, and that we'll just be able to just be there for our brothers and sisters. And we pray for those uh, leaders in worship and for, for Brian, who's going to come later on, Lord, uh, and everybody else involved this morning, that you'll just, uh, you just speak through each one of us, Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's rise to our feet, if you can, if you're able. Come on. Sunday morning. Take our seats. Uh, now, perhaps they knew I was hosting this morning, so they've only given me two notices. Perhaps they, perhaps they won't be off in a minute, so, but uh, we'll do something uh, fun in a minute. Not that notices aren't fun, but we'll, we'll, do, we'll do notices first. So if you could put notice number one up. Oh, thanks, Beth. Bit of ap- atmospheric music from Beth. Eh? <laughs> no problem, no problem. We've all been there. 
Okay, so uh, this morning, before we go this morning, we've got uh, Brian Farr speaking to us this morning, starting uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. Well, you're going to finish it as well. You're going to start it and finish it. But um, so there's some people in the church who weren't sure who Brian Farr was. They hadn't met him before. So um, I, I, Brian doesn't mind me making a bit of fun of him because yeah, if he was still a pastor, I wouldn't, but he's retired now, so I can make fun of him. But um, they said, who is this Brian Farr that's come in? Someone said, oh, he's tall. Somebody else said he's bald. And somebody else said he's got a well-clipped beard. So, so, so Brian is that gentleman. Have you seen a man with a well-clipped beard? He's that man there. He's ready and raring to go. So we're looking forward to hearing Brian soon. Uh, pitch and putt. Uh, Saturday 9th of July. Uh, no skill required. Uh, this is a, a, a men's social at Gowerton Golf Range. And uh, this is open to, uh, to all uh, men. And if you want to know more about this, then get in touch with... Uh, uh, either Alex Clements or I'm sure I'm going to just nominate Kev Harris because Kev knows a bit about golf. He's another he's another no skill no skill required category. Kev Harris. <laughs> yeah. So if you've got no skill, then go and see Kev. If you've got a bit of skill, see Alex. But uh, it'd be a really good uh, uh, social morning because basically you're stuck with three other people and you've got to go around with them for about three hours. So you're going to have to talk to them at some point, even if you're getting more and more depressed as your round gets worse and worse. Yeah. You can drown your sorrows with those other people. So. Uh, please um, come along, sir. I'm going to mention um, uh, something else, which uh, my wife is going to kill me for and probably not going to speak to me for the rest of the day. But uh, also on um, Saturday, July the 9th, uh, me and Becky are doing um, uh, a sponsored walk. And I'm, I'm not up here um, asking you to give us money, but I just uh, more for prayer that we make it round because we're, we're doing a walk uh, 27, mi- 27 miles uh, around Gower. Uh, so setting off at 5 o'clock in the morning and uh, hoping to still do it in the same day, hoping to uh, get there before the, uh, the sun sets. And we're doing it in aid of uh, Swansea, uh, Swansea Baby Loss, which is obviously something very uh, close to our hearts. And raising money specifically, um, if you have a stillborn, then you get taken to um, a certain room in the hospital, which has just recently been uh, refurbished. But uh, unfortunately, when they refurbished the room, they didn't soundproof the room, which, uh, uh, as you can imagine, if you have a stillborn and then uh, you're there for a few hours and you're just hearing the noise of, uh, of babies crying around you for the rest of the day, it's very... Uh, uh, it's very hard to, uh, to take on board. So we're raising money to, uh, to get that room soundproof for, uh, for people who go in there in the future. So uh, we have got a, a Just Giving page. Again, I'm not asking for donations, but if you want to, that's great. And I'll just stick that up on, uh, on DCF later. But yeah, please do think of us on, on July the 9th as we attempt to walk around the Gower. Uh, so Friends and Neighbours uh, is on 5th of July. And it just says strawberries and cream. So just come, you'll just have a pot of strawberries and cream. I'm sure there's plenty of other things. I'm sure there'll be a quiz. Uh, David Brewer normally does a mean quiz, so I'm sure there'll be a quiz going on there as well. So come along, and that'll be uh, at the Gospel Hall. And also, that's the last one, sir. Uh, also, uh, we've also got just advance notice that we've got the, the Sunday school, or oh, sorry, not the Sunday school, the yo yo, old school year. Uh, so the, the yo yo prize given on um, July the 10th. So um, there'll be a rush on uh, Amazon Prime soon. But just to say that if you are coming, we're going to be having a barbecue straight after the service. Just a quick show of hands. Who's going to come along to the Sunday sc- the yo-yo prize giving? Jackie, me and you sit. Me and you around a quarter pound of Jackie. So what do you mean here? Anyway, guys, go on. Come on, it's going to be good. Come on, it's going to be good. It's going to be the best barbecue you've been to post-lockdown. Yeah, everything will be individually cooked. We're going to cater for gluten-free people. Jeff and Sean, put your hands up. That's he's coming. We're going to cater for anything. We'll be doing quarter pounders. Anyone? No? Okay. But everyone's coming, basically, isn't they? Yeah? Yeah, okay, brilliant. Okay, just, just so we know just roughly how many people are going to come, so we know how many burgers we're going to be left with at the end for us to have for tea for the next few days. Okay, so I said those are the, those are the only notices. So we're going to, who, who's watched on Saturday night? It's finished now, but the 1% Club on Saturday evenings, BBC One. Yeah, so this is, when I, when I first came on, I thought this is a bit naff, but then after about half an hour, I was hooked. Because basically they ask, um, they ask 100 people a series of questions. And the first question is a question which the, the whole hundred people got right. And then they worked down to the last question where only one person out of those hundred got the question right. So I thought we'd give it a bit of a go this morning, seeing as we've got plenty of time. So the first question I'm going to ask you, this is a question which was asked to hundred people and all hundred people got right, okay? So see if you can have a go at this one. So logically, which of these children's characters could be included in the sequence? Humpty Dumpty, Tinky Winky, Andy Pandy, and is either... NC Wincy or Postman Pat? So bear in mind, all of the 100 people asked got this question right. Pat, can you go and ask them to get a clause? It's come out somewhere. Oh. Yeah, no problem, we saw that. You know, so, Humpty Dumpty, Tinky Winky, Andy Pandy, which, which I have either NC Wincy or Postman Pat? NC Wincy? NC Wincy is correct. Well done. 
So all 100 people got answer. So that's the one we should be getting right. So the next question, 90% of people got this one right, okay? So which photo of these famous landscapes, landmarks, cannot be real? So which photo of these famous landmarks cannot be real? Is it A, just in case you're struggling, that's the Statue of Liberty, B, the Sphinx, or C, the Eiffel Tower? So which one can't be right? A? Correct. Is A? Did anybody know why? London's in the background. Yes, I know, yeah. Well done. So that's the question. It's 90% go right. Right, the next one, 50% of the people got right. Okay, see if you can get this one. Take a look at what is written below and answer the question. So take a look at what is written below and answer the question. Oh, I can hear some good answers come in. For a friend, yes. <laughs> Neil. That's right. Which is the way? Beth and cool down there. So the, the answer is, oh there we are, hey, hello Wembley. Okay, so the answer is words and this. So well done. Okay. Well, well, I'm quite good at saying credentials. Okay, so the next question, only 25% of the 100 got this one right, okay? So which of these does not mean backwards, not forwards in a foreign language? So which of these does not mean backwards, not forwards, in a foreign language? C? Any, any other? Correct answer is C. Well done. Right, the next question, only 10% of the people got right, okay? Your newspaper has 20 pages with the front cover is page one and the back cover is page 20 and you read every page, how many times do you have to turn the page? Eighteen, okay. So your newspaper is 20 pages with the front cover is page one and the back cover is page 20 and you read every page, how many times do you have to turn the page? Some tens down there. Any others? Nine? Eleven? Fourteen at the back? Ten? The correct answer is ten. Well done. You're in the top ten percent. Two more to go. This, the next question, only five percent of the people got right, okay? So if you're starting to get this, these ones now, then you're, uh, you've got a few brain cells. What number between one and a hundred has the most syllables when said out loud? You haven't got time to go saying all the hundred numbers. Okay. So what number between one and a hundred has the most syllables when said out loud? <laughs> got a 67 over there. 77 down here. 77 at the back. There's a few calls to 77. Correct answer is 77. Well done. Now the last question. Out of all the hundred people who did this one, only one person got it right. So if you get this one, then you can go home, you know, with your head held high. You probably won't be able to fit through the door. What can be placed between three and seven to produce a number that is bigger than three and smaller than seven? <laughs> so what can be placed between three and seven to produce a number that is bigger than three and smaller than seven? I look like you're doing a press conference here with all these microphones in front. <laughs> <laughs> The answer is, of course, which you heard from my right, a decimal point, which would make it 3.7. Oh. So if you got that, only one person out of 100 got that right. So we've got some, kind of the brainiest people seem to be kind of concentrated on the front. So 
If you want to sit on the front, perhaps that's why people aren't sitting on the front, because it's reserved for the, uh, for the brain boxes. <laughs> there you are, Beth. And... <laughs> Beth and came up with the questions. Okay, moving swiftly on, we've got from, from the Sublime, so we've got a children's song now. So I think, are the band ready? The band are ready? And I'm, I'm, who's doing the actions? Am I doing the actions or are we doing? Okay, I think we all need to stand up because I'm going to attempt with the actions. I haven't done the actions of this song for a few years, so basically I'm going to make them up. Oh, yeah, come on. Come on, guys. It's a, it's a summer morning. Come on. It's a Sunday. You've all been watching Paul McCartney late last night. Come on, up again. Come on, up again. Except for you, Beth, yeah. You were coming up with those questions for me. Are we ready? Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. And He holds us in His hands. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. And He holds us in His hands. He's higher than the skyscraper. He's deeper than a submarine He's wider than the universe And beyond my wildest dreams And He's known me and He's loved me Since before the world began How wonderful to be a part of God's amazing heart. Our God is a great big God our God is a great big God, our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hands. Our God is a great big God, our God is a great big God, our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hands. He is higher, He is higher than a skyscraper, and He's deeper than a submarine. He's wider than the universe and beyond my wildest dreams. And He's known me and He's loved me since before the world began. How wonderful to be a part of Amen. Okay, I'll, I'll just pray, and then we've got um, Caddy, who's going to come out and do a reading for us. I'm just going to catch my breath. Okay, Lord, just thank you for those, those, the truth of those words, Lord, that you are, you are a great big God, Lord, and you, and you hold us in our hands, Lord. Such easy words for us, to, for us to sing, Lord, but so important to just get those entrenched in our minds, Lord. And it's so good that we just teach those to our children, Lord, at, at a young age, Lord. And... Yeah, just teach us some more of, of your truths this morning, Lord. Just let us have hearts that are, that are open, Lord. Just open up our hearts, Lord, as, as we worship, Lord, and just, just uh, melt our cold hearts, Lord, as we've come from, from busy weeks and different situations, Lord, and different troubles um, that are weighing us down, Lord. Just make it all about you this morning, Lord. We want to meet you, Lord. We want to embrace you, Lord. We want to... Sit at your feet, Lord, and we just want to just bathe in your, uh, your amazing love, Lord. Amen. Psalm of thanks. One, shout to the Lord all the earth. Two, 
Serve the Lord with joy. Come before him singing. Three, know that God, know that Lord is God. He made us and we belong to him. We are his people, the sheep he tends. Four, come into the city with songs of thanksgiving and this courtyard with songs of praise. Thank him and praise his name. Five, the Lord is good, his love is forever and his loyalty goes on and on. Amen. Shall we stand? I look upon the face of him who took my shame. I'm sheltered from disgrace by Jesus. Through trials and through pain, a hope in Christ remains. By faith to Jesus standing in wide open spaces of your grace lifting up your name
turn our eyes to you this morning you're, you're our glory and our prize and I pray um, for Brian as he comes to speak to us Lord would you just uh, let us be ready for what you have to say through him Lord would you bless him as he comes to speak to us in Jesus name Brian Farr with two exclamation marks here. I don't know why. It's really lovely to, to be with you. Let's just um, read this passage from uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 and um, the first uh, 11 verses. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body... Arm yourselves also with the same attitude, 
because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account of, to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Well, it is absolutely brilliant to be uh, with you here in uh, Dunwood this morning. I love coming to this place. I've come here over many years, and uh, the last time I came, it was in the middle of COVID, so there was half a congregation, so it's great to see so many gathered this morning, but I always, always have felt and sensed the, the Spirit of God uh, in this place, place, so I feel home from home, and especially when you welcomed me this morning as well. I felt my age then, and uh, uh, and it's lovely to see so many links uh, from my past, and uh, it's brilliant to be, uh, to be with you. And I know Ali feels uh, the same as well. Uh, since I was uh, with you last, I've begun a, a new chapter uh, in my life. Um, having retired from Parklands uh, after 25 years of, of, of leadership there, um, life is fascinating, isn't it? It's, and I'm in a new chapter. I don't know if any of you are in new chapters of life uh, this morning, but I'm in a new chapter of my life. And the, the, the reading that Phil has given me to speak on is helping me to write some new um, words, some new sentences in, that first, in this next chapter of my life. I don't know whether you recognize that there are different chapters, and you might be coming to the end of a chapter or at the beginning of a chapter. I'm at the beginning, and God's Word is, is helping me this morning. Because so, this, this, this Word, which I've read, is alive. It is relevant and speaks to the preacher. I'm speaking as much to myself this morning uh, as, as to you. And I've been asked today to look at this section of Peter's letter in chapter 4 under the heading, Living for God. Living for God is tough, isn't it? Anybody find it really easy? <laughs> no, thank goodness I'm not on my own. Uh, living for God is tough, but it is the best life. It is the greatest adventure. I am more convinced of this uh, than ever. There's a phrase that I often hear, choose your best life. Do you hear that all the time? Choose your best life. Well, I want to urge you this morning to choose the best life. In my new job, I'm working as a, a local area coordinator. Some of you have already come on to me this morning and said, yes, I know what that is. So I've left some leaflets um, out there. I felt after finishing with Parklands that I had something left to give. So I got um, a, an application form and filled this, this application in for a job with Swansea City Council. And I've got a part-time job as a local area coordinator for Pencloud and Three Crosses. And I'm helping people to find a good life and how to get their good life. And of course, as a Christian, I'm sort of bubbling here and I'm thinking, I'm not just about good life, I'm about abundant life. Because this is, the best life is the abundant life, it is the eternal life that Jesus offers. So I love offering people a good life and helping them journey to a good life. But guys, we are people of abundant life. I want to ask you this morning, 
Uh, are you walking in the abundance of life? Are we really living for God? Uh, probably 20 years ago now, I spent many uh, weeks with Peter studying this letter uh, and then taking Parklands through it. I think I preached on about six weeks on, on Peter. I gave actually uh, Sarah Davis, Sarah Marks, my, my notes on, uh, on uh, and I sort of photocopied, photocopied all the, the passages and, and they were about that long, you know, I stuck them all together and I wrote my notes and she's got them. I was looking for them this morning so I could take this scripture out, and I remember she's got them. Um, and I've always been intrigued by this man, Peter, and the chapters of his life, his failure as he denied Christ, and the new start he had with the risen Jesus. Peter's life was not straightforward. There were victories and failures. And I don't know what chapter you are in your life. Perhaps you're in one of great triumph, or one perhaps where you were living in failure. But Peter can identify with us wherever we are today. And uh, in this part of his letter, Peter brings out a number of keys for living for God. And I want to pick um, just five this morning. I can't go through every verse and every line in the time that we've got, but there were five things that really sp stuck out to me about five keys of, of living for God that I felt God was speaking into my heart uh, about. And Peter, in his letter, you may be aware, if you have listened in on this series, he spends a lot of time talking about suffering. So when Phil asked me to speak from 1 Peter in this series, I was hoping it would be some verses that missed out suffering. Because in all honesty, deep down, I don't want to suffer, do you? I don't want suffering in any form, uh, to be honest. I don't. I, I want an easy life. And pain avoidance is me. I see Gary Greger here this morning. He's a great um, marathon runner. And I want to be able to, to run the marathon without going through the pain barrier. Do you know what I mean? Just to, just to be able to run. But there are, there are pain barriers that you have to go through in life. And the thread of suffering is woven through all of Peter's letter. So I couldn't escape it this morning in my little section that I'm talking about. The pain of life in whatever form is for a purpose. Pain avoidance totally in life actually is not good. So we need to address this subject of suffering again, as you have in past weeks. And Peter raises uh, a fascinating thought about this subject of suffering that has helped me as I've studied it over these last few weeks. And Peter says to the, uh, the believers in verse 1 and, and 2, arm yourself with the same attitude as Christ. Be prepared to suffer, because suffering can bring a victory over sin that you won't see unless you go, go through the pathway of pain. It will help you to live for the, the will of God. Let me say that again. Suffering can bring a victory over sin that you won't see unless you go through the pathway of pain. So I felt God saying to me, view suffering differently. Don't just try to get away from it and, and um, just you know, to, to move away from, from any pain at all, because it, it isn't any good. Actually, it is for a purpose. You see, there is something about the suffering seasons of life that brings transformation. Suffering for Christ brings transformation and change to our lives, often a deeper type of change when I've suffered, when I've had to go through issues, and, and I've really had to wrestle with them, deeper transformation and change has come in my life as a result of it. And the suffering seasons of life bring victory. Suffering for Christ can help you secure victory over sin, even a finishing with sin. How does that happen? 
Well, it comes as a result of us being cast upon God in our suffering and knowing his mercy more deeply. When cast upon God, you feel you don't want to sin. So when I'm suffering and I'm thrown upon the mercy of God, I can finish with sin. And suffering comes also. The suffering season of life can bring identification with Christ, which breaks the hold of sin as we identify with the suffering Christ. This year is mine and Ali's 40th wedding anniversary. Just don't look old enough, do we? You're shocked at that. I can see you're shocked at that. And during the 40 years, plus the couple of years that we were going out, uh, I've got a book, and I summarized each year of our, well, it's 42 years that we've been together. Uh, I, I summarized, summarized each year with a heading. So 1980 was the year of Lennon and Froome, because John Lennon was killed on the day before we went away on a holiday together as young people. Mark was there, Mark, Mark Davis, and about 20 of us came away on this holiday and I asked Ali out for the first time. So 1980 is the year of Lennon and Froome, because Froome was where the holiday cottage were, was, where we, we started going out. 1990 was the year of my baby girl and promotion. Harriet came along. <sighs> my life changed her forever. But that's a different story. I won't go into that today. 2000, the year of Albanian separation. Alison went away to Albania for a, for, a, for a year. It seemed like a year. She was away for two weeks, left me with the kids. And uh, she went to work in an orphanage, and it was uh, a year of planning around that. 2014, the year of miracles. In Parklands, we saw people come to Christ nearly every week. We saw baptisms. We, I got fed up of having to open the baptistry every week. I honestly said, can't they all do it together? One, 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 one. And it was the year of miracles, 2014. I never, ever saw anything like it before or since. But there was a year, 2004, which I called, like the Queen did for one of his, her years, the Annus Horribilis, the horrible year. Can I tell you about one reason why that year was so horrible? Because I suffered like never before. It was my year of real suffering. But as I look back, it was a year that shaped me like no other. Let me tell you a little story of 2004. Some of you might remember it. I was chairing Swansea City Prayer, the church leaders group praying for the city. And some amazing things were happening in Swansea at that time. Mick Walford, one of the leaders of LifePoint, was passionate about launching a prayer initiative in the city, praying for your neighbor. His vision was to get every home in Swansea, every house in Swansea and its occupants prayed for by a Christian. It was crazily wonderful. On my office wall in Woodlands Church, I had a map of Swansea, a massive map of Swansea, and we began to plot on that map where individual Christians from all the churches in the city lived. So I had lists of, of people submit their mem church memberships, and we were plotting across the city these dots where, uh, where the Christians were, the little colored dots throughout the city, and we saw amazing answers to prayer, neighbors starting asking questions. Some people were saved, healed. Wonderful things were happening, except with me. Because something went incredibly badly wrong with my neighbor, which has left an indelible scar on my soul and spirit. Here was I chairing city prayer, enthusing everyone about the incredible Pray for Your Neighbor project, helping drive forward this strategic prayer initiative for the city. And, um, and yet I was in the middle of falling out with my neighbor. It was remarkable. All because we were put in a conservatory up at the back of our house. We had lived in excellent relationship with this guy for 15 years, never a crossword, but now he turned on me like never before. They were terrible days uh, for me. Here was I waxing lyrical on Love Your Neighbor, and urging, praying for them like never before. And somehow I had turned my neighbor into the neighbor from hell. I was devastated and humiliated by my example, although I hadn't done anything wrong. 
gosh, I feel, I feel the weight of it now, you know, it's just, it, it was just such an incredible thing. I felt I was near to a nervous breakdown, and I was so bad, Ali took me off on holidays to Kefalonia, and the night before we went, my neighbor was blasting music through the walls. He'd, he'd been like a, a mouse for 15 years, and, and now he was blasting music through the walls. And I left my mother. <laughs> my mother was a godly woman. She could handle herself, but she knew the Lord, and she was strong in the Lord, and she knew that there was something spiritual about that. I le left my mother in the house, and me and Ali went away. I'd never encountered anything like this suffering experience in my whole life. My dad had died many years before when I was a young man, but not even something like that could compare with the agony that I was going through. I don't want suffering, guys. But as a result of it, do you know, I knew a greater transformation in my life than ever before because of the extent of, of mental pain and emotional suffering that I was going through, a deeper change happened in my life, but it still is, remains with me. I never forgot it. I just checked with Ali this morning. We've just gone through a recent building project. So any building project that happens now drives me to a place naturally of panic, and I have to come back and cast myself upon the Lord. So we've just had a building project, just doing our uh, bathroom and, and toilet, and my son-in-law's doing it. But I'm in panic, and then I have to cast myself on the Lord. And I said, did I deal with it better this time, Alan? She said, you did. You did, love. So that was good. And, uh, and so, um, you know, my suffering, which I believe to be a spiritual attack due to what I was leading, was instrumental in me being cast upon God in ways that I had never been before. I identified with God in his suffering, and my relationship with him was deepened. My mother's prayers were answered. My journals at the time reflect the journey that I went on. I read them now, and I'm thinking, gosh, Bri, you knew God's hand in that. I remember being in my mother's house. Is that the time already? Flipping eggs, sorry. Um, um, yeah, I, I won't go into that anyway. But I knew victory over sin and a, and a hold of sin broken in my life. Why? Because I became closer to God as I saw a miracle happen. And do you know what happened? In the next couple of years, my neighbor died. But in, you know, I wouldn't, I'm not saying that. <laughs> this, this, <laughs> it sounded, sounded wrong. I didn't mean that negatively. But incredibly, his wife asked if I could pray at his funeral in Porth Call. I will never forget standing over the grave, feeling some of the pain that this man had caused me and the healing touch that I knew, now knew over my soul. And I thank God for this guy who had nearly wrecked my life. And remarkably, out of his estate, listen to this now, his wife left Parklands a gift and asked if she could come to Parklands church service one Sunday morning and present it. It's like my enemy came to the church and presented me with a gift. It was incredible, Ali, wasn't it? I just couldn't believe what God had done in his grace and his mercy. You see, there is purpose in suffering. If we truly learn the lesson of suffering, it can help us finish with sin, not perhaps once and for all, but it takes us to a different place as we are cast upon God. If it hadn't happened then, I must ju might just have carried on with life as it was and, and be more sinful than I have. But no, suffering can drive you into the very will of God. So one key for living effectively for God is to view suffering differently. Right. I've got four other points, but they are quite short. Not as long as that one. Is that okay? Right. Secondly, be done with that old reckless life. Peter then reminds these early believers of their past lives. This is what you were about, guys, before you came to Christ. And a second key for living for God came out of the passage as Peter is urging them to be done with the old, reckless, wild way of living. And he describes what their old sinful life looked like, debauchery, which is excessive indulgence in bodily, sensual pleasures, sex, alcohol, drugs, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, which is drunken revelry, drinking deeply and frequently, detestable idolatry, 
and he calls it reckless, wild living, decadent, uninhibited. And Peter reminds them how they had spent enough time doing what the pagans do. That's what the pagans do, and that's what you used to do, guys. And he comments about how the pagan non-believers are surprised that these new followers of Jesus who have been saved out of all this uh, and their past life, uh, and they now choose Jesus, and they are piling, these pagans are piling and heaping abuse on the new Jesus followers. Have you encountered that before? Why on earth are you living as a Christian? Look what we are doing. This is fantastic. And I wonder what the pagans were saying. Perhaps they said, perhaps look how thrilling, exciting this is, what we are doing. This lifestyle is amazing. Why on earth have you left it behind? This is so incredibly exciting. But in a hedonistic, pleasure-focused, self-centered existence, existence, it is really an illusion, guys, that can bring, it can't bring lasting satisfaction. It's not to deny it can't bring temporary satisfaction, but it never brings lasting satisfaction. Some of the greatest highs are followed by even deeper lows. Guilt and shame far outweigh the high of the moment. The old life doesn't deliver what it promises. It's an illusion. A glance behind the scenes, Amber Heard and Johnny Depp, we've been trans transferred into their world, and we uh, onlookers in the nature of their life and the way the stars live. What well, would you want that? I've been reading a bit uh, over recent times about George Michael and and just the agony in which he lived. Incredible. I had a, a text last night from a guy I've been helping with alcohol problems. Two years he's been clear, and he, he texted me last night as I was sitting watching Paul McCartney or something. It was, uh, uh, what was it, the cricket before? It was the cricket before. I think it was a brilliant day in the cricket. And, um, uh, and he texts me, and he says, Brian, I've been two years clean of alcohol. I saw him in the midst of it, guys. Alcohol doesn't... You know, it's, it's an illusion that it, it's satisfying. That when you see someone who is in the hold of it, it is, it is tragic. And this guy, it's just, just been amazing. And perhaps they said, secondly, not just look how thrilling, exciting this old life is, but how boring following Jesus is. Why on earth are you following him? Let me tell you this. When lived in the way God intended, there is nothing like the adventure of following Jesus. There's nothing as exciting as walking with him. It's a life of the fruit of the Spirit, you see. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, kindness, patience. Living in that is wonderful. It's only when it's ripped away that you realize how devastating life can be. And as I mix with more and more people in my job, I am more convinced as ever, ever than ever that the abundant life that Christ offers is the right life, is the way to live. It is the fulfilling life. It is the best way. And Peter is saying, my fellow believers, be done with the old lifestyle of wild, reckless living. And perhaps some of us here today, we hanker over our old lives, or we want to mix a bit of it, you know, the old and the new. Let's mix a bit of all this. And we become envious of the old life. But Peter says to us today, leave it behind. It promises what it cannot deliver. It ruins, it wrecks lives, families. And one day, people who live lives characterized by all this will have to give an account of themselves before God. The grass is not greener on the other side. God's Spirit will help you if you are struggling today. And then the last few verses of this section, verses 7 to 11. Now, God really began to speak to me through Peter. And a third key for living for God was this exhortation to stay awake to stay alert in prayer because the end is near. And I felt that God might be challenging us because some of us might have become a little sleepy in prayer, a little lazy, perhaps apathetic. It may have all become rather routine, dull, and boring. I take my granddaughter, um, Elsie, she's only one, to a play group, and we, we sing a little chorus. We lay on the floor, you know, and we sing... When all the cows
crows were sleeping and the sun had gone to bed. Up jumped the scarecrow and this is what he said. And I felt God saying, sing that to them this morning. <laughs> you know, we might be sleeping with the cows, guys. And God says, awake, be alert in prayer. I've done my back in now, eh? <laughs> How can we awaken our hearts in prayer? Just five little things, five mini challenges. One, be aware of the big picture. Be alert on the world scene. What is happening in the nations? Recognize the signs of the fig tree. Operation World is a great, uh, it's a great help. I've got it on my iPad. I was watching it this morning. There were something like 167 people praying for India this morning at a particular time, you know? Pray for the nations. Be aware of the big picture. We are in such dangerous times, guys. We are living in an incredible world like I've never known. Who will pray and usher in his return? Be aware of, secondly, the national picture. The ungodly leadership of this country is crazy. No, I actually like Boris. And I sit it down sometimes and I'm thinking, huh? I cannot believe what, what, what he is symbolizing. And this man is in charge of our nation. We need to pray, guys, all for our nation and for godly leadership, for our queen. What is going to happen when our queen goes? Be aware of the local scene. Are you aware Mike Day, Mike Day is the, the new Lord Mayor? Yeah? Yeah? We, as the first citizen of this city, we have a godly man who is a Christian. And I'm his chaplain this year. So this morning, uh, uh, yesterday morning, we went to the Armed Forces Day uh, uh, celebration outside the Guildhall. And here was my day, you know, being a godly example to people in the Guildhall of, uh, and all the godly values. Will you pray for him? Get him to come here. Get the Lord Mayor to Dunvant one Sunday. You've got his chaplain. He charges more than me. Me and mine is the fourth one. If you're a Christ follower, there will be things going on in and around your family and loved ones that are do, to do with spiritual warfare. Are you just living life ordinarily? You know, we had to pray and pray and pray for my kids to come to know Christ. My, my mother was such a prayer warrior for, for, for them. And I, I, I think there's a fight for my grandchildren now. I need to pray for my grandchildren. And are we really in our elite game of prayer for our families, or are we sleeping with the cows? And then keeping a heart of worship, number five. My experience last week was just God speaking to me through Simon the leper's home, and Mary comes and does a beautiful thing to Jesus. That's what it says. She, she breaks this alabaster box of nard and, and, and pours it on, on the Savior. She does a beautiful thing to Jesus. Are we doing beautiful things to Jesus? How, are we worshiping, worshiping him truly in, in prayer? Number four. A fourth key for living for God that Peter excited me by in this passage is to live a life consumed with loving others. This is life-changing there is a craving for love and belonging in this society. There is such loneliness. How can I love others more deeply? How can I overflow the love of Christ from my life? I was just thinking of the five languages of love that we've taught for over so many years in marriage preparations. Perhaps some of you have, have, listened, have heard them or some of you haven't. The five languages are these. Time. Some people need your time. I, I met with a woman last week in my job. She says, so thank you so much for spending some time with me because there's no one else really in my world who does that. Can you send, send a message of, of love into the time frame of your life and, and, and love people with your time? Touch. In COVID, some people... Were never touched, leave alone, hugged by anybody. When was the last time you hugged somebody? Touched somebody, held their hand, 
Words, the power of encouragement. There was a guy who used to come to Parklands. His name was Steve Jenkins. He was the greatest encourager in my life. When I left his presence, I felt 10 feet tall. Why? Because he used words to encourage me. Gifts. His father, Norman, used to bring chicken dinners all over the place around our, our fellowship. And you'd open the door one day, and there was Norman with a chicken dinner. He showed his love through gifts and through serving which is the last language of love, an act of kindness, random act. My wife is full of these acts of random kindness, uh, but I haven't got time to tell you about that this morning. Imagine if you were criticized by be, of being a Christian who loved too much. Ed loves too much. I've been like, he loves too much. I wouldn't even like that to be, <laughs> I'd love that to be on my gravestone. He loved too much. He loved people too much. And finally, be generous with the gifts God has given you. My last key for living for God is being generous, not least being generous with the God-given gifts. This is fantastic. Again, it's life-changing. As Christians, we have all been given gifts by God. We have got gifts of the Spirit. They are not to hold on to or show off. Here is my gift. I'm just going to bring it this morning. It's for use. To build up the church. To bring others to Jesus. And they are used to be used generously, lavishly. Peter talks about being faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Now God's grace is unmeasurable. It is lavish. It is generous times infinity. And Peter mentions ways to be generous. And he says... Offer hospitality without grumbling. What an amazing gift to have to use, isn't it? We, when we first got married, we had pale carpets and a habitat suite, which was pale. And I didn't like the young people coming into our uh, house because they would tread down the pile. And they dirtied my, my nice, you know, habitat suite. And then a year in, you know, we realized we couldn't live life like that, house proud. Be hospitable without grumbling. There are those with you, uh, of you with hospitable guests, gifts. Use them lavishly. If anyone speaks, do so as one who speaks with the very words of God. How generous is that? I feel God wants to be generous and speak the words of how much he loves you today. He wants you. He wants relationship. He wants to walk with you. He adores you, whatever you've done. We sang a, a, a line of a song about disgrace. And sometimes I feel disgraced before God. Oh, wretched man that I am, says Paul. And God wants to say today, oh, how I love you. If I had a wallet, says God, I would have you, your picture in it. You know, it's like that. It's precious. If anyone serves, do it heartily, not grudgingly. Living for God. Why do we live for God? We do this so that God may be praised. So I look at your life and I say, let's give God an encore, encore because of her life, because of his life. Praise God. That's, that's, that's a lovely, th you read the message, it comes out like that. Let's praise God because of her life. Let's give God the glory. Let's give him an encore because of the way they live. Living for God. View suffering differently. Be done with the old reckless wildlife. Be awake in prayer. Be consumed with love. Be generous with the gifts God has given you. What an amazing life that is, isn't it? A life of adventure and excitement. What a brilliant life that is to live for God. I pray that Dunwant God will powerfully raise up men and women in this place who would live with some of these characteristics for his glory. Amen.
Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty that we've heard this morning and Lord I heard um, Kath, Kath Woolridge uh, yesterday saying that when we've hit rock bottom that Jesus is that rock at the bottom and Lord I pray that whatever weeks Lord that we're about to have um, whether they're going to be at the height of the mountain um, or um, in that depth of the valley Lord I pray that you would help us just to press into you um, as our rock and Lord as we go out and we um, we go to our jobs and our homes. Lord, I pray that you would help us just to...